sir. Yes, so, sir. As we are going little late, I, I think I'll I'll take to the next session. I think I, I have the next session. I'll finish it faster so that Dr. Anjana can have her session on acute aortic dissection. Uh, I think the, any intro, uh, any introduction is needed. Mm -hmm. yes. I'll just can you shortly introduce? I'll just start. Yes, sir. Just give me a second. Yes, sir. Okay, good evening, sir. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. M. Sudhakar Rao, a consultant cardiologist at Nepal Hospitals, Bangalore, and associate professor at the Suba Medical College, Manipal. With over 10,000 coronary angiograms and 5,000 angioplasties uh, to his name, Dr. Rao is a recognized expert in interventional cardiology, specializing in IVUS guided PCI and complex coronary intervention, a fellow of the American College of Cardio Cardiology and European Society of Cardiology. Dr. Rao is also a dedicated educator and researcher, shaping the future of cardiology. As we gather today for the Cardio Cardiology Summit in collaboration with the Heart Health India Foundation, please join me in welcoming Dr. M. Sudhakar Rao, who will share his expertise on managing cardiac emergencies. Over to you, sir. My slides are seen? Yes, sir. It's with the blue. Okay. Right. So, thank you all. I think, uh, so we are left with two clinical topics and three uh, patient-based topics. Uh, after the four very, very elaborate sessions on hypertension, chest pain, dyspnea, and heart failure, I will take you to a case-based approach to the management of pulmonary embolism. Many of them have questioned what is well score and all, and what are other various things. But I think uh, I'll keep it very simple. A few cases, a different type of cases maybe, and then we'll discuss in sort how to manage these cases. So this is a case one, uh, a patient of 34 years old male, his clinical presentation was syncope, that is a loss of consciousness of three minutes, shortness of breath, and history of pain in the lower limb for three days. There was no risk factors, and the vitals were a heart rate of 114, a respiratory rate of 34, and a blood pressure of 90 by 60, which is very low, and the saturation, which is 90%, very low. When you have such patient, the first thing which should come to your mind in a patient with syncope or loss of consciousness who has a swelling in the leg and a pain in the leg and a breathlessness is pulmonary embolism because when you see a patient who is breathless in emergency department who has a deep vein thrombosis or a swelling in the leg the first thing which should come to your mind is pulmonary embolism and when you have a loss of consciousness and acute breathlessness in a patient with pulmonary embolism it means you are drilling with a massive pulmonary embolism, which is evident by the higher heart rate, low saturation, and low blood pressure. It itself tells that the patient is very sick, and this patient is going to need a thrombolysis in the next few minutes. Now, when you see the investigations of this patient, you have to be quite fast with your investigation. You see the ECG, which is showing a tachycardia, uh, S1, Q3, T3, which means there is a right ventricular strain and some pulmonary pressures which are high and incomplete RVVB, more of a right ventricular strain. If a patient has right ventricular strain pattern in an ECG, it definitely means the right ventricular pressures are high and you are dealing with a quite a massive pulmonary embolism. Troponin high, it means there is a right ventricular in involvement in the form of RV dysfunction. In all cases with pulmonary embolism who come, when you know it is a pulmonary embolism, there are two scores which you should do. One is a PACI score and other is, is a simplified PACI score. I will come on to it, what are the variable, but in emergency department, all such patients, you have to do a PACI and a simplified PACI score. Now, when you do the echo, this patient definitely you know beforehand that they are going to have a RV dysfunction means the RV will be dilated. A normal EF, pulmonary pressures are on the normal side because of the high right ventricular dysfunction. Most of the patients with pulmonary embolism, they do not have a high pulmonary artery pressures. They have a low pulmonary pressures because of a RV dysfunction. 
pulmonary acceleration time is low, it means there is a RV dysfunction. A tap say which involves, which suggests that there is a RV dysfunction is low and the pulmonary arteries are not much dilated. You do a CT pulmonary angiogram in this case, we showed a saddle embolus. What is a saddle embolus? Is It is in the bifurcation of the main pulmonary artery causing almost the complete occlusion of the right pulmonary artery and the some occlusion of the left pulmonary artery. As you can see this image, this is the right pulmonary artery where there is no blood flow going distally. This is the left pulmonary artery where some flood blood is going, but there is some lumen defect. The right pulmonary artery is fully occluded with the, the right pulmonary artery is fully uh, uh, occluded. Now, how do you manage this? As I already told you, this patient has come with breathlessness, cardiogenic shock, saddle embolus, and that is why this is a patient with a massive or a high-risk pulmonary embolism with a right ventricular dysfunction with a deep vein thrombosis. Now, how do you manage this case? There is no doubt in all patients who are in shock, like their BP is low, all such embolisms you have to thrombolize in the emergency department. The drugs can be streptokinase, tenecteplase, or retiplase. Most commonly, we use tenecteplase. But in some cases where there is a financial constraint, streptokinase being a cheaper drug, you can use it at 2.5 lakhs unit stat and then 1 lakh per hour for the next 24 hours. Tenective place injection is usually a single shot injection which you can give over 5 to 10 minutes based on the weight. If the patient is less than 60 kg, you can give 30 milligram. If the patient is 60 to 70, you can give 35 milligram. If the patient is more than 70 kg, you can give full 40 milligram dose. After giving this thrombolysis, after a two to three hours, you have to start the patient on heparin infusion or sometimes we start low molecular weight heparin at, two, at 0.60 milligram twice a day. Some patients do prefer heparin infusion because in emergency, if this patient goes very sick, you may have to take them for a surgery or a catheter directed procedure. That is why some people do prefer heparin infusion instead of low molecular weight heparin dose. The patient was successfully treated and discharged in a stable condition. Again, I'm going fast to the second case of a 34 year male. He has presented with a chest pain, right calf pain, history of DVT, <clears throat> took some time medication and stopped. Definitely he has a risk factor because he has stopped the medication, but he's also a smoker and a known case of deep vein thrombosis. This patient heart rate was 103, but his blood pressure compared to the last case was normal, 110, not on any hinotropes. Respiratory rate was high, but the saturation in room air was 94, which is near normal. Our routine investigations were normal, drop was negative. ECG, if you see, there was no RV strain pattern. There was some S1, Q3, T3. So if the patient saturation is normal, drop is negative and he doesn't have hypotension and other thing, the PC score will be intermediate. That is low risk, class 2. And simplified PC is at low risk. In all this patient, they fall in moderate or intermediate risk. Intermediate risk, it depends whether there is a RV dysfunction on echo or if the drop is positive. Drop is negative here. And if you see, there is no no involvement of there is some amount of RV dysfunction. If you can see by the echo, the tap say is low, pulmonary acceleration time is low. And if you see the CT pulmonary angiogram, there is a filling defect in the segmental arteries. There is no saddle embolus, there is no thrombus in the main right or the main left pulmonary artery. It's mainly in the segmental branches and the main left and right pulmonary artery is normal, the patient has a DVT. In all such cases, we are very clear that there is no need to thrombolyze immediately, though some people do prefer thrombolysis. It is a low-risk pulmonary embolism with RV dysfunction and bilateral lower limb DVT. If this patient you give only heparin is also good enough, heparin or a low molecular weight heparin for three to five days and on discharge, you can give oral anticoagulation. However, some people do prefer to thrombolize such cases because there is RV dysfunction and the chances of recovery giving thrombolysis is sometimes better. So it depends on the physician what he does in such cases. Some people thrombolize, some people do not thrombolize such cases.
Now, this is the third case of a 37 year old male who had a pain in the lower limb of one week, developed some hemoptysis and chest pain. Every he is a smoker, his heart rate is 98, BP is normal, respiratory rate is normal, and saturation is normal. This means, and when you do his drop eye, it is negative, and ECG is totally normal. There is no tachycardia, no right bundle branch block. PACI is very low. Simplified PACI is also one. It's at very low risk. That means these are the patient, his echo, when you do, it is totally normal. And when you do a CT pulmonary angiogram, there is a small filling defect in both the upper lobar and lower lobar segmental artery, whereas the main pulmonary artery, right and the left are normal. It Doppler shows the right lower limb, iliofemoral DVT. He falls in a very low risk pulmonary embolism. And such patients, ideally, even you can discharge from your emergency department, giving them directly oral anticoagulation without admitting them. However, to be on the safer side in our uh, country, we do admit such patient for a day or two. We send the investigation, thrombophilia workup, and then we manage with him clexane, lower low molecular weight clexane or heparin for one to two days and then discharge them home. This is a case for why I told this case is very important. This is a 37 year old male presented with shortness of breath hemoptysis. His alcoholic heart rate is high, BP is normal, respiratory rate is high, and saturation is little on the lower side. When you do the troponin, it is negative, and his ECG, if you see, it is grossly normal with some ventricular trigemini. His PC score is very low, and his simplified PC is at very low. However, his echo showed RARV dilatation, and there is some form of RV dysfunction, and there is a filling defect in the left pulmonary artery. He falls in very low risk pulmonary embolism. And then we have finally a case who is very sick case who has presented with dyspnea, syncope, giddiness and chest pain. Heart rate is very high. BP is very low on inotrope. This is one case where the patient is on ino initially not on inotrope, but then he has to be started on inotrope. Saturation is very low. Respiratory rate is very high. Investigation, if you see TROP is positive, ECG is properly right ventricular, strain pattern, sinus tachycardia, low voltage QRS, suggesting there is an underlying cardiogenic shock. And the PACI is very high risk. The high chances of mortality and simplified PACI is also three. It means it is a high risk. ECO shows RARV dilatation and a severe RV dysfunction. He has a filling defect in the right main pulmonary artery extending in, into the segmental branch and near total filling defect in the left main pulmonary artery. High risk, right ventricular dysfunction, patient had a sudden cardiac arrest and immediately you had to give a streptokinase infusion. If your patient is financially okay, you can give a tenecti place dose and start on the inotrope. Sometime, if this doesn't work, you have to go inside and do a catheter-directed thrombolysis or a catheter-directed procedure. However, this patient succumbed instead of all the resuscitation. Uh, as I told you, if a patient is presented with you with acute dyspnea, giddiness, loss of uh, consciousness, saturation is very low, BP is very low, it means you are dealing with a high-risk or a very high-risk PC or a massive pulmonary embolism. However, if the patient is telling I have dyspnea only sometimes I am walking, that time I am having breathlessness, my chest pain is more pluritic, that is on breathing. It means the pulmonary embolism is low risk or uh, small, uh, not massive, it may be submassive or it may be a small. It means you may not be needing immediately thrombolysis and those people have usually normal BP, normal saturations and normal heart rates. ECG may not find much changes in a patient with submassive or Small, short, small pulmonary embolism or low risk pulmonary embolism. Syncope is a feature of usually right ventricular dysfunction, hemodynamic instability. Some people do have hemoptysis because infarction may cause pulmonary hemorrhages. Signs the patient, as I already told you, the patient may have hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, saturations will be low, and they will have high JVP. The hypoxia, saturation may be on the lower side. Now, many people were asking what is a well score. Well score is used to assess if the patient chances of pulmonary embolism is there when a patient with acute breathlessness presents with emergency department. The score includes DVT, which has three point. Alternate diagnosis of pulmonary embolism is unlikely. It has three point. Heart rate more than 100 has 1.5 points. 
If the patient is immobilized or went underwent any surgery in last four weeks, it has 1.5 points. Previous DVT pulmonary embolism has 1.5 points. If the patient has hemoptysis or treated with the cancer within last six months, it has one point. If there are points of four or more, it means high probability of pulmonary embolism and you have to immediately send that patient for a CT pulmonary angiogram. If the point is less than four, the chances of probability of pulmonary embolism is low. Sometimes if you do not have finance, uh, means if you want to send a mom, you can do a D-dimer. A negative D-dimer almost always rule out pulmonary embolism. However, if it is positive, in that case, you can do a CT pulmonary angiogram. Gen MI score is a less commonly used score for the assessment of pre-test probability. D-dimer, as I told you, if a patient you want, you, you want to save some money and if your pre-test probability is low of a pulmonary embolism, send a D-dimer. If it is negative, the chances of having a pulmonary embolism is always uh, ruled out by 99.5%. However, there are other conditions like infection, recent surgery, recent pregnancy, or in a patient who has undergone orthopedic procedure where the D-dimers are usually positive. In all such cases, you may not be able to assess the D-dimer test. ECG, I have already discussed with you. If a patient has high-risk pulmonary embolism or very high risk or a massive embolism, they will have a right ventricular strain pattern, sinus tachycardia, and S1Q3, T3. A low-risk pulmonary embolism or a submassive or small pulmonary embolism may not have a strain pattern. They may just have a sinus tachycardia or incomplete left bundle, bundle branch block. ECHO is an important measure. It is used in the POCUS evaluation of a Patient with dyspnea for pulmonary embolism, you see a right atria, right ventricular, which is dilated. Then the first thing which should come to your mind is a pulmonary embolism. Then you see the right ventricular dysfunction by TAPSA. There is something called right ventricular LVD sign. If there is a severe pulmonary embolism or a massive, it will cause a D-saved heart. That is the left ventricular will be D-saved. And then we see the rule of 60-60 sign where the pulmonary artery pressures are all around 60 millimeter of mercury and the acceleration time is usually less than 60. Again, it means we are dealing with a massive pulmonary embolism, a TAPSA of less than 16 and a tissue Doppler of a uh, decreased systolic RV uh, annulus, tricuspid annulus velocities suggest we are dealing with a pulmonary embolism. In all, because the CT pulmonary angiogram is available in most of the places nowadays, any patient whom we suspect pulmonary embolism, where a well score is more than four, we invariably go and do a CT pulmonary angi angiogram. The specificity is quite high, 96%. The sensitivity is almost 83%, not very bad, but still we do. Sometimes patient has renal disease or in pregnancy where we are not able to do a scan to give a radiation or give a contrast. In all those cases, you can do a lung scintigraphy, ventilation perfusion scan, which is as good as D-dimer, high negative pro predictive value to rule out a pulmonary embolism. As I told you, who are at risk for early death? As I told you, if they have cardiogenic shock on admission, low saturation, high respiratory rate, if they presented with syncope, high RV dysfunction, PC score is high or very high, and the troponin are very high, anti-proBNP levels are very high, they suggest that the risk of mortality or early mortality is very high. So what is a PC score? It takes into consideration the gender, history of malignancy, if there is a chronic heart failure, any chronic pulmonary disease, pulse rate more than 100 at 10, a BP of less than 100, respiratory rate more than 30, if you have a saturation less than 90 and an altered mental status, and hypothermia, it means the PC score will be very, very high. And there are other points which tell the simplified PC score. As I told you, if the patient has massive or a high risk or a very high risk pulmonary embolism, if the BP is low, you have to immediately give thrombolysis to such patient. If it doesn't work, you have to do a catheter-directed thrombolysis or a surgical embolectomy if everything fails. If the patient doesn't have hypotension, but he has both our, uh, uh, troponin is negative, no RV dysfunction, you can manage such patient in hospital even with the uh, or outpatient department. You can give uh, low molecular weight heparin for two days and discharge on oral anticoagulation. Sometimes either your RV dysfunction will be there on ECHO or your troponin will be positive. Those are the cases where you have to take a decision on whether you want to thrombolize or not. So it depends on the cardiologist opinion and how bad is the patient to take a call. 
Sometimes thrombolysis help in such cases. But if a patient is old age with bleeding history or a history of previous bleeding manifestation, better not to thrombolyze a patient with intermediate high risk. But all the high risk, you have to thrombolyze such patients. So this is the algorithm for the management of pulmonary embolism. As I told you, low risk, nothing to do. You can admit for two days or outpatient management with anticoagulation. All the high risk, you have to do a, either a thrombolysis or a catheter-directed thrombolysis or a surgical embolectomy. Intermediate, if it is TROP is negative and if your RV dysfunction is not there, you can just do the anticoagulation in such cases. Thank you again. I, I think I won't take, uh, sorry, I won't take much time. I will answer all the questions in the chat box and I will hand over the next session to Dr. Uh, uh, Anjana.